uh, my name is Denise O'Hagan. I um, am affiliated with both Queen's and the Public Health Agency in Northern Ireland here. And as well as that, I'm the co-chair of the self -harm, uh, Regional Self-Harm Steering Group. So I'm coming at this from a variety of perspectives, uh, which hopefully uh, will make sense to you. So what I'm going to do today is to present to you the findings from the Registry of Self-Harm for Northern Ireland and some other bits of related research that have been carried out um, in Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland on the basis of data collected through the Registry of Self-Harm. So just a little overview of what I'm going to cover, just touch on briefly what is self-harm and what a registry of self-harm is. We'll give you some of the statistics from Northern Ireland and make some comparisons with the Republic of Ireland and other UK cities, and then a little discussion around of the implications of that and what the next steps might be. So in terms of what self-harm is, uh, may have nicely touched on it uh, previously, but generally we divide self-harm into either cases of self-injury or self-poisoning. And self-injury can uh, take many forms, such as cutting, burning, hitting, hair pulling, scratching. The, the, the list is probably endless there. In terms of self-poisoning, drug overdose would be the most common, but it would also capture other poisonings, for example, uh, weed killer and, and things like that. So those are the two main categories of self-harm. And the intent behind the self-harm can vary quite dramatically. At one end of the spectrum, which most people will make an assumption, is that it is a wish to die, it, it, it is an, a suicide attempt, but very often that is not the case, and it's actually a, a coping mechanism. So there, there's quite a, a spectrum and a range of intent behind an act of self-harm. But it is one of the strongest predictors of suicide, which is why we need to take it very seriously. And uh, it is a step where we can intervene. And it, it does highlight these individuals as a high risk group where, where we can intervene. And the risk is, is high in this group. Um, people who have attended hospital with an episode of self-harm are known to be between 50 and 100 times higher. Uh, they have a group 50 to 100 times higher greater suicide risk in the next year than the general population would have. So it does significantly elevate your risk having attend, attended hospital with an episode of self-harm. Now, until quite recently, there's been very little uh, data in Northern Ireland about the extent of the problem of self-harm. I think for many years, we did collect information about admissions to hospital, but as you'll see later, that doesn't give us the full story. We have, in recent years, had some surveys among adolescents which have uh, reported about 10% have engaged in self-harm at some period in their lives. Now, some people may recognise the cover of this report. This is the Preventing Suicide report that was produced by the, the World Health Organisation in 2014. And the reason I put it up is that they do highlight um, in the first box there, under surveillance, the importance of having uh, systems in place which capture data around both suicide deaths and suicidal behaviours such as self-harm. And both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland are leading the way really here in this. Um, Ireland is the first country, the Republic of Ireland is the first country in the world to have a, a national register of self-harm. And Northern Ireland now in the last few years has also got full coverage in terms of the registry of self-harm. So that's a, a very positive uh, thing that is happening here in both uh, uh, North and South of Ireland. Now, this little diagram, uh, the proportions on it are not quite right, but it's just really to, to illustrate a, a concept to you. <coughs> Self-harm is often very hidden, and there's, this is just a, a, an iceberg diagram, and you can see much of the self-harm that occurs happens in the community, and we really don't know about it. It's hidden, and we, we, these people very often don't seek any help. The little bit above the surface, then, hospital-treated self-harm, this is where the registry of self-harm is, is coming into to play. Now, as I said, for many years we did collect data about admissions to hospital, but that is really only giving us part of the picture because we know that only around 60% of people who attend hospital with self-harm actually get admitted to the hospital. So there's another 40% there, which until quite recently we were really unaware of, of the extent of the problem, and that's where the registry of self-harm is very useful. And then you can see that at the tip of the iceberg here we have cases of suicide. Now, self-harm and suicide are closely related, and many people who self-harm do go on to uh, um, complete suicide, but 
not all suicide uh, people who commit people who have engaged in suicide have had a history of self harm, but there is a close relationship. My um, this next slide just outlines what the purpose of a registry of self-harm is, and I, I think from Maeve's discussion previously, probably many people are, are aware of the local registry. But the purpose is to est establish the extent and nature of hospital-treated self-harm, and I might stre stress here it is hospital-treated. So the registry does not capture information about patients who present to the GP or to minor injury units, There's certainly in Northern Ireland, we don't anyway. Uh, so it, it's really only hospital-treated self-harm. The purpose again is to monitor trends over time and also by various uh, geographies to inform policy and service development in the area of suicidal behaviour, which is why we're here today, and to build the evidence base. Now, as I mentioned, uh, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland are um, making very positive steps in this regard. In the Republic, there has been a registry of self-harm in place since 2002, and it has full coverage of the hospitals, 36 hospitals in the Republic. In Northern Ireland, uh, we have more recently come on board with this. A pilot was established in the western area of Northern Ireland in 2007, and since 2012, uh, we now have full coverage across the, the other five trust areas in Northern Ireland. So I'm going to share some key findings with you now from the Northern Ireland Registry. So we can see uh, in the pie chart here the, um, that overall there were about over 12,000 attendances to hospitals in Northern Ireland with either self-harm, which is the 8,453 figure, or suicidal ideation, which is 3,623. So the suicidal ideation cases, they have not engaged in self-harming behaviour. They are thinking about suicide or thinking about self-harm. And that accounts for about a third of the presentations to our emergency departments there, as you can see. The other two-thirds of cases have engaged in a method of self-harm. And the scale of that and the sheer numbers are, are quite shocking. So we'll just uh, look now... The, the next graphs show you both for Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland the age and sex profile of uh, people who are engaging in self-harm. So the, the rest, most of the rest of my presentation relates only to self-harm and the suicidal ideation cases are excluded. So we can see that uh, the, the shape of the graph for Northern Ireland and Ireland is quite similar with, as we heard earlier, around about half the cases occurring in the, the younger age groups. Um, up until about 25. Um, we will look at a little bit more detail at Northern Ireland later on, but just to show you that the, the, the age profile is, is similar in both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, but the, the rates are quite different. You can see that the Northern Ireland uh, rates are higher than Ireland in almost all age groups there. So what might explain this difference? Well, we have different healthcare services in place uh, north and south of the border. In the Republic of Ireland, there's about a 100 euro charge if you attempt an emergency department for most people, unless you have a medical card. And as, as you all know, the, the attendance at emergency departments here in Northern Ireland is free. So there may be a slight deterrent in the Republic from attending, and that may be why we are seeing slightly higher uh, figures in or slightly higher rates in Northern Ireland. But I don't think that's the whole picture. We know from other research that there is an increased prevalence of psychiatric disorders and mental illness in Northern Ireland. And some of that may be related to the troubles. But part of um, what we're seeing there may be an increased uh, culture of help-seeking behaviour in Northern Ireland, which if this, that is part of it, is actually a positive thing. Looking then at the methods that people who self-harm are engaged in, the most common methods are drug overdose and self-cutting. And that would be quite standard in Republic of Ireland and, and elsewhere. So the rates of drug overdose, about almost three quarters of patients who engage in self-harm do so by taking an overdose of, of medications and about a quarter engage in self-cutting with the other methods there being much less common. And in comparison, comparing these statistics with the Republic and elsewhere, um, we can see that our Northern Ireland statistics are broadly similar to what's seen in, in England, but are higher certainly in terms of drug overdose than... Uh, the Republic, 
So in the Republic, about 66% of self-harm is related to drug overdose, and higher here in Northern Ireland at 73%. Now, the, the overall rates are higher, so you would expect that the drug overdose rates are higher as well. So we'll just look in a little bit more detail about at drug overdose. It's well known that people who engage in self-harm through drug overdose do so by taking their own medications, not exclusively, but often that is the case. And this uh, slide presents the methods or the, the particular drugs that are used in, in episodes of drug overdose. And a very similar picture is evident between the Republic of Ireland and Ireland. The drug most commonly used in overdose is a minor tranquilizer. At 42% in the Republic of Ireland and 27% um, in Northern Ireland of all overdose episodes. So that is one of the things that I would be picking up on on the next steps and the implications uh, towards the end of this. I think we need to be doing more to limit access to medications such as minor tranquilizers and ensure that they are prescribed appropriately. And the, the illicit market is, is also growing where we hear it, in relation to this. So certainly we, we need to take steps in terms of prevention to limit access to minor tranquilizers, as well as misuse uh, of other prescription drugs. And people may well be aware that in the past, measures around particular drugs have been successfully implemented, such as reductions in the pack sizes of paracetamol, and banning uh, of particular paracetamol compounds have shown a reduction in overdoses by those particular drugs. If we look then at the involvement of alcohol in self-harm, and uh, as may have referred to earlier, it, it is an issue certainly that um, the public do be concerned about. In terms of the registry, we identified that alcohol was involved in about half of all presentations uh, to hospital with self-harm, so 49% in Northern Ireland. Now, when we say involved, we haven't actually got the Le the level of uh, alcohol taken. So that just, it, it could vary from a small amount of alcohol right through to a very large quantity of alcohol, but it was involved to some extent in about half of all presentations. And that varies quite significantly across the province here in Northern Ireland, lower at around 39% in the Southeastern Trust and higher in the Western Trust area at 67%, sorry, 57%. If we look in more detail at areas within Northern Ireland, and I only have the statistics here for the Legacy Dairy City Council, we can see that that's high uh, at 63%, and I suspect that we may see similar um, in other urban centres, but I don't have those statistics, and that is something we need to, to look further at through the registry. So certainly alcohol misuse and involvement is a big issue in terms of self-harm. The figures in Northern Ireland are similar to, to what we know about England, but significantly higher than the Republic of Ireland. And it is often a, more of an issue in male episodes of self-harm than female episodes of self-harm. Alcohol does, it's, it's significantly associated with the time of day that people present to the emergency departments as well. The alcohol, people presenting with self-harm where alcohol is involved increases steadily throughout the day, very little in the daytime hours, peaking, uh, in the early hours of the morning, but rising steadily throughout the evening. And this placed successive demands on the hospital, the emergency department teams, the mental health teams who are tasked with responding to this issue. And people who have alcohol, uh, who have taken alcohol as part of the Self-Harm Act are much more likely to leave the emergency department without being seen and therefore are placing themselves at increased risk. It's also frequently involved in highly lethal methods of self-harm, such as drowning and hanging, we, we see alcohol involvement much more so in those sorts of cases than in other cases of self-harm. If we look then at um, numbers of people presenting to our hospitals uh, or emergency departments with self-harm, we see this sort of pattern now. I appreciate the, the text is small there, may be difficult for you to see, so I'll, I'll just read them down. The top one is the Royal Victoria, then the Ulster, the Matter, Craigavon, Altnagalvin, Antrim, Causeway, Southwest Acute, Daisy Hill, Lagan Valley and the Down. So you can see that the, the greatest numbers are attending to our Belfast hospitals, the top three there. But this really indicates service utilisation as opposed to health service need. And some research in the Republic of Ireland has shown that when they have looked at 
the incidence of self-harm in relation to the distance that a person lives from a hospital department, that there is higher incidence in areas that are nearest to the hospital departments. Now, we have yet to examine that in terms of Northern Ireland uh, data, but it's quite likely that we would have similar findings. So that poses a challenge for us in terms of we are only seeing part of the problem. There may be people who live in more rural parts of, of our country uh, in Northern Ireland here who are not presenting to the emergency department who may well have needs who may be presenting to minor injury units or GPs or may not be presenting anywhere at all. So th there is uh, that need that we're not th seeing through the, the self-harm registry data. If we now look at the incidence rates of self-harm across the various trusts in Northern Ireland and the, um, the gender profile. We look first of all at the right, uh, the, the far right columns, that's the Northern Ireland data, and we can see that the gender balance across the province is approximately equal. So males and females are presenting in, at equal rates uh, to our emergency departments. The rates are by far the highest in the Belfast area, followed by the Western Trust area. And that may link to what I just said about incidents in urban areas where people can access hospitals uh, more easily. So we, we need to better understand the issue for people who are not presenting to the emergency departments with self-harm. That may give us a fuller picture. But from the data we have at the moment, it would suggest that the incidence rates of self-harm are highest in the Belfast and Western Trust areas. This is just looking in a little bit more detail at a slide we saw earlier. So this is the age and gender breakdown of self-harm across Northern Ireland in the year 2013-14. So the, the blue bars are females. We can see the highest rates of self-harm are in females age 15 to 19, closely followed by males in the age 20 to 24 band. You can see that there are significantly so, you know, significant numbers of people and, and rates of self-harm in the older age groups, and those are people who are at very high risk of suicide. People who, in, in the older years, who present with an episode of self-harm are at very high risk of suicide and need uh, quite uh, intensive assessment and, and likely follow-up intervention. If we look then at repetition of self-harm, we saw earlier that there were 8,453 attendances to our emergency departments in Northern Ireland, but that, those attendances were made by only 6,000 people. So people who self-harm often do so more than once in a given year. But if we look at this year in particular, around 80% of people presented only once. So that's our top row there. About 80% of people presented only once in a given year. Around 11% presented twice. 3.6% three, 3, three times, 1.8% four times, and quite startlingly, 2.5%, which is a relatively small number of people, presented more than five times. Now, 2.5% is relatively small, but that's 127 individuals who are presenting more than five times, but they account for about 14% of overall attendances to, self to our emergency departments. So there's a clear need to target people who are f repeating self-harm frequently that will have a great impact on the pressures faced by our emergency departments and mental health teams and obviously have a very positive impact for those individuals if we can reduce the repetition of self-harm. Now, if we look at the rates of self-harm in Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, uh, we have touched on this earlier, but the rates are significantly higher in Northern Ireland, 327 per 100,000 versus 199 in the Republic. <coughs> and in particular, males have almost twice as high an incidence rate as in, in Northern Ireland as they do in the Republic of Ireland. When we compare both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland then with the rates that are seen in other cities in England, we do see that the Northern Ireland uh, rates both for males and females are coming out almost top of the league table here. So the highest rates are seen in females. Sorry, uh, the highest rates in females are in Limerick City with a rate of 705 per 100,000, but that is closely followed by Derry City at 664 per 100,000. 
So we're second, Derry City is second in that league table in terms of rates for females. In terms of males, the highest rates are seen in Belfast, closely followed by Derry. And you can see there are the rates for a range of other cities across the UK and Ireland. So clearly in Northern Ireland, we do have a significant problem in relation to the incidence of self-harm that we need to address. And as I said earlier, we are not even seeing the full picture here. We're only seeing part of the problem that is presenting to our emergency departments. Now, in the western part of Northern Ireland, where the registry was implemented first, we have much more data over a longer period of time uh, to analyse. So um, recently, we produced a six-year report for the western area. And some of the key findings coming out from that report show, in relation to the repetition of self-harm, that it's highest in the short term, with 20% of people repeating within three months. And the risk of repetition is very closely related to the number of previous attendances an individual has had with self-harm. So you can see various statistics there. So those who have had five or more presentations are at, at much greater risk of repetition, and the risk increases incrementally in a dose-response fashion. And people who leave the emergency department without seeing a doctor are also at high risk of repetition, with over a quarter um, repeating. And we saw earlier that people who leave the department are likely to have alcohol on board. So if we try to address the alcohol misuse issue and try to address the flow of patients and the care and received in the emergency departments, hopefully we could reduce people leaving uh, without being seen. And then hopefully that may reduce the risk of them, those individuals repeating. Now, we were also able to look at the homeless and have identified this group of people as a vulnerable group. Across Northern Ireland, there were 330 self-harm attendances uh, for self-harm and about 200 attendances with suicidal ideation without having self-harmed. And the risk of repetition in this group was higher than in uh, the general population. And the age and the gender profile for homeless individuals uh, differ slightly as well. They tend to be younger and tend to be more likely to be male, with 73% being male. So this is a group, clearly, that we uh, do need to try to, to address, uh, among other vulnerable groups. Now, in our six-year report, we did identify that there may be some good news in relation to trends. It, it's, it, it's hard to make any definitive uh, statement in relation to this, but in the Western area, there was a 6% increase in self-harm during the period 2007 to 2012. And while any increase is unfortunate, it is, it is, there has been a greater increase in other areas. In the Republic of Ireland, the increase over that period of time was 12%, and it's reported in the USA that there was a more significant increase as well. So while it's early days and it's hard to uh, state anything definitive in relation to this, th there, there may be positive impacts of the work that we're doing through our suicide uh, prevention strategy in terms of trying to <coughs> at least control the rise and the rate of increase there. So in terms of implications and next steps, as I mentioned, we're not seeing the full picture and it may be worth gathering data from other sources such as minor injury units. I know in England, they are looking at gathering data from uh, primary care, although that's in very early stages yet, but it's something that we should watch and perhaps uh, follow in Northern Ireland. So we should continue to monitor trends and evaluate uh, interventions with the use of this data. We need to continue to take measures to prevent self-harm and promote coping strategies among all age groups, but probably particularly our young people to prevent self-harm occurring in the first place, and then when it does occur, to have effective measures in place to intervene uh, to reduce risk of repetition and suicide. We need to clearly address the risks associated with self-harm and coexisting substance misuse problems, and this very clearly uh, links with Karen's uh, earlier presentation. And we need to target people who repeatedly self-harm. We saw that, there, that a very small number of people account for a very large number of our hospital attendances. So, our trusts need to target those individuals to, to reduce uh, the risk and the demand on services. 
We need to target high-risk groups, and I'll give you some statistics in relation to the homeless, but there are likely to be other high-risk groups where we should be having intervention and prevention strategies as well, such as looked after children, prisoners, etc. And um, I think our policies and strategies need to start to focus on those. We need to reduce the access to means of self-harm, and I, I mentioned to you about effective measures that have been taken in relation to paracetamol and paracetamol compounds in the past, and I think we now need more emphasis on the minor tranquilizers, and also, as is currently happening anyway, access to means such as bridges and, and other methods. And we need to use all this data that has been generated from the self-harm registry and from related research to inform service developments and to inform training programmes for staff across many areas of the health sector, but also through to other sectors, education and housing, etc. because these people will engage with many uh, sectors. And also, this, re this data is the basis of further research. There are many other research questions that can be uh, asked on the basis of this data. And one of the key things I think that we need to look at is the use of our emergency departments and whether the high rates we're seeing in Belfast and parts of the Western Trust are related to proximity to services or is that true need in those areas and that's something that needs to be explored through future research. So finally, I'd just like to thank uh, many of my colleagues both from the National Suicide Research Foundation in Cork and the Public Health Agency uh, for their input. I am merely presenting and many others have, have done the work. So thank you very much.